Turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. I read recently, and I don't remember where it was I read this. I don't know if it was in our bulletin or if I got it in a guidepost or our daily bread, but there was a, an elder in the church or a deacon praying, and the preacher was listening to the deacon's prayer, and the deacon was praying, and he's like, Lord... I, I don't really like salt. He says, I'm not too big on lard either. I don't care much for flour. Sugar's never been my thing. Eggs. I'd like a fried egg. All these things by themselves, though, Lord, they're, they don't amount to much, but when you mix them together right, I do love biscuits. So thank you, Lord, for putting things together right. And the preacher said he'd never forget that prayer, wrote that prayer down. Now, I, didn't, I might not have quoted it exactly, but I, I love the thought that there's a lot of different pieces and ingredients and situations in our lives that by themselves we're probably not too fond of. They don't spark any kind of excitement. Now, I, I'm really bad at drinking water. I love it when the tea kettle sings, though, because I'm gonna, gonna have some coffee or some tea or some hot cocoa or, so, or a cup of soup or something. I know I should drink more plain water. I got coffee drinkers in here, I know that. Y'all ain't too good at drinking water, water either, are you? Mix some beans, ground up with that water, and you're like, ah, this water is amazing now, <laughs> right? It's like the individual parts we don't get too excited about. And, and our lives are like that. We, uh, we have certain aspects in our lives, certain situations, certain times in our lives, things that we go through, things that we suffer, things that we enjoy, even. And a lot of it, by themselves, they don't make sense. A lot of the things that, especially when it comes to suffering, a lot of the things that we suffer through, a lot of the things that cause us pain and sorrow, by themselves, they don't taste good. They don't feel good. They don't bring on good memories. God has a way of putting all the pieces together and making them fit, making something beautiful, Amen. something wonderful. I, I, I still, to this, and I'm going to remember my entire life um, watching my wife go through surgery and, and to, to have to care for her. That was... Yeah, by itself, it was horrible. The, you know, you don't really, listen, I'm, a, you know, you came, you are not ignorant of what kind of guy I am, so let me just be frank with you. Uh, let me be real with you. Um, you don't really get to know somebody until you've smelled what their pus smells like. Now, that's disgusting. I know it's too early. I know it's 1120. That's still too early to be talking about bodily fluids. But when you're changing drains and bandages, that stuff by itself is horrible. It's disgusting. It makes you squirm. But we look back and I think about how my marriage became stronger. I realized how much I loved my wife. 
It's like, oh, I knew I loved my wife. I married her, right? I mean, I didn't need another reason. But I learned some things about my wife that I didn't know. And my wife learned some things about me she didn't know. And it made our relationship stronger. You might have some ingredients or some pieces in your life that you don't like. I've I've never stuck my finger in the salt shaker and was just like, mmm, salt. Right? I love sprinkling it on my mashed potatoes, though. feels weird. feels weird. You know, I, I, I don't even know if I'm going to read. Well, maybe I'll read it and then I'll go where I'm going to go. Let me just read Colossians 3, this first few verses. I'm going to go somewhere else. In verse 1 it says, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Read that again. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And he lists some things that are earthly so you can have an idea what those things look like. He says sexual immorality, impurity, passion. Passion? Really? Evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. These you too once walked when you were living in them. In these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free. But Christ is all and in all. Mark read during our prayer time an interesting scripture I want to go back to. I consider that the sufferings there in Romans 8, verse 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Now, if you'd have told me, hey, Richard, I'm going to strengthen your marriage. It's going to be glorious. You and your wife are going to love each other more than you know that you knew that you could love each other. You're going to understand her in a deeper way than you've ever understood before, and it's going to be glorious. But I'm going to take you through this garbage first. I probably wouldn't have done it. Well, fortunate for us, we didn't have a choice. Bless God. Bless God. You are not in control. Why does it bother you when someone's talking when someone else is praying? You ever think about that? Why do you have to control your environment? 
Why can't you just let someone be who they are and you worship God? These are just questions I have for myself. I really thought about it today. Like I've listened to our elders pray and I've heard voices while my, while my elders are praying before, not just today, but anytime. And I've had to question myself. I'm like, why does that bother me? Why do I want to tell people to be quiet? Who do I think I am? You know what I mean? Like, my father-in-law has a, a tendency in his congregation to um, not avoid uh, things in the congregation. And what he'll do is he'll address it directly. And in one, in one church that he went to, there was a baby crying. And he just stopped everything he was doing. He went to that child and he asked the mother if he could hold the child and the child quit crying. And he just forgot everybody else in the congregation. Just stopped the service. I love him for that. As a matter of fact, that family, they came to our wedding, didn't they? Was it the same family? Yeah, it is the same family. The Kansas City. Yeah. Like, the impact that that made on that family. Like, you're not in control, so like, being upset that things aren't going the way that you want them to go. Like, that attitude that's like, hurry up, preacher. Like, where does that come from? Do you ever think about that? It comes from pride is where it comes from. Like, this is how I think church service should go. And if it doesn't go the way that I think it should go, well, something was wrong. It's like, when in life has that ever been true? That if things go your way, then there must, you know what I mean? Like, God's put all kinds of stuff in your life that you have no control over, that you can't stop, that you can't cure, that you can't get rid of, that you just have to go through. And the Bible says that he's all-knowing and all-wise. And he allows us to go through things. Like, it's only our pride that makes us reject the life experiences that we're having. And we see a microcosm of that in church. You see it in school. It's like... We want our children to stand up for themselves, to be bold, to be brave, while we tell them to sit down and shut up. Did anybody else see a problem with that? Like, there's, there's a duality. There is a double-mindedness in the nature of man. James addresses it. He says, when you pray, he says, you're not supposed to be double-minded when you pray. He says, you're supposed to believe that you will receive what you ask for. Because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. He's like a, like a wave of the sea tossed to and fro. And Jesus said, if, if your eye be single, if your focus be single... You'll be full of light. But if it's double, you can't serve God and money. You can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve Christ and demons. I consider the sufferings of this present time not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Paul said that we, through much tribulation, must enter the kingdom of heaven. There's a revealing of our hearts when trouble happens. I am not yet what I should be, but I have been given grace in one area of my life, is that when trouble comes, I'm finding it to be a gift Trouble has revealed the cowards in my life. That might seem like an awful thing to say. Like when trouble 
has come into my life and in my social circle, it's revealed the cowards to me. And it's saved me time from, because I don't have to trust them now. Like, I don't waste my time and energy trusting the cowards with things. You know, am I making sense? Like, one of the, this is going to sound strange to many of you. Like, I don't know what it's like to be African black in America. I do know what it's like to be Asian brown, though. And a lot of the racists in my social circle, I figured out who they were just by introducing my immigrant mother to them. All I had to do was say, hey, this is my mom. And then watch them and watched how they treated her with her thick accent and her dark skin. And it's revealed to me who I can and can't trust. I learned that a long time ago. That wasn't something that was recent. I learned that before I came to Christ. I learned that living in a small country town in Kansas. And I don't want to spend a lot of time pointing out the negative. So what I'll tell you is it revealed to me also the people who really loved me and loved my mother. Those who weren't prejudiced and those who weren't hateful. Trouble reveals. Like, we talk about, God, let your fire fall. It's like, do you know what you're asking? God, we want your spirit. We want your presence. God is an all-consuming fire. And if you have his presence in your life, in the life of your family, he's going to burn some stuff up. God's a jealous God. That's a concept that we don't preach a lot. Any on, on, because, and the reason I think we don't preach a lot is because people misunderstand the word jealous. They automatically think that only sinners can be jealous, that jealousy is some bad thing. No, the word jealous, for God to be jealous, a jealous God, he's a husband to a wife, you, the church, He's a husband to a wife that he loves very much. And his jealousy comes out when you give all your affection and love to someone else. A jealous husband is actually a righteous husband. You know that? Like, let's turn it the other way around. A jealous wife is a righteous wife. If I was cheating on my wife, she would be right to be jealous. Because I belong to her. Does that make sense? God is a jealous God. You belong to him. So when you set up idols in your heart and in your mind and you make things more important than God, God cut off the hands of Dagon, the scripture says. That was just a statue. Listen, if God will cut the hands off of a statue that's set up in a temple, what do you think he's going to do to all the things that you hold so important and as a higher priority than him? We want God's presence and his fire and his spirit so badly. You want to know how you can maintain it, walk in it, live in it? You got to let every idol die including yourself. Isn't that what Paul said? That you died? That you, the God of your own world, you, the selfish little G God, that you have died and your real life hmm, is hidden with Christ and God. It's Colossians 3. People don't want to die. We have a survival instinct. Like this, I, I've, I've tried to warn people and warn myself, this is not going to go the way you think it will. And I'm applying that to everything. 
your personal situation and mine, and the current situation we're in right now. Like you sitting there, me standing up here, even this isn't going to go the way you think it should. Like we have to let go of that idol of, of control, of thinking that we know better than God. God is going to do some things in your life that are glorious and amazing if you would just surrender to him. You know, I've found, I've found in my own life that the blessings from God have often come from people that I've wrongly judged. You know, if you don't like black people, God's the kind of God that will send all your blessings to you through black people. Just to humble you. Like, if you don't like people that wear red, I don't, that seems like a weird thing. God will use those people to bless you. Like, God is the God who raised up Nebuchadnezzar. The scriptures say, I brought the king of Babylon to judge my people. King of Babylon didn't decide to do that himself. That's scary. Like, if you really think about the father of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's chosen to do in the history of God's people... He's a scary God. That's why it's so important for us to just surrender. The scriptures in the New Testament talk about people being saved as through fire. Everything they have is burned up, but they come through smelling like smoke. They themselves are saved, but they, this is what Paul says, but they suffer loss. Kurt read from the Amplified Matthew chapter 6 in a beautiful version. I've got the English standard here. It says in Matthew 6, 19, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What do you value? What is your treasure? My old preacher used to say, I can, t I can find out everything I need to know about you if you just give me your phone and your bank statement. If I know who you're communicating with and what you spend your money on, I know everything I need to know about you. Like what you value, what you love, who you love and what you love, where your heart is. Listen to this. This is not separate. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, the Greek rendering in the King James is, if your eye be single. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. This Greek rendering for bad and for healthy, it's, it's the idea of singular and divided. Like, you've got two eyes, right? And your two eyes, in order to focus, what is focus? Focus is when you cause these two eyes to focus in or to center in on one thing. Now, you might be able to take in all these many things, but it's one picture. Does anybody here see two different pictures with their two eyes, or do you see one thing? Didn't God design you with two eyes that sees one thing? Like, in your mind, the information going into your eyes becomes singular. 
Like you, this wasn't lost on Jesus. He's the one that made the eye. And he chose to give you two of them and cause you to see one thing. Think about that. He gives you two eyes and he, he wires your brain in such a way that you see one image. Have you ever had one eye suddenly stop working with the other? I know that there are people in our congregation who have, have had detached retinas, have seen fuzzy. A lot of you wear glasses. Some of you, if you don't have your glasses, you're not allowed to legally drive. Am I right? Do I have some people that on your license, if you don't have your glasses, you are not allowed to legally operate a motor vehicle? You have to be able to focus. Like if mankind has figured out that you need to be able to focus in order to operate a car, how much more focus do you need to operate your own life? If your eye is healthy, if your eye is single, your whole body will be full of light. In the context, listen to what he says, in context. He's talking about a divided mind, and I can prove it to you. Look at the next verse. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. He talks about treasures being laid up in heaven and treasures on earth. Two things. He says you can't serve two masters. You'll hate one, love the other. You can't serve God and money. And right in the middle of both of those thoughts, treasures in heaven, treasures on earth, God and money, right in the middle, he says, if your eye is healthy, how many eyes do you have? Two. The context within context, with text, encompassed here is this idea of two realities. Focus with your eyes is when your two instruments can focus together in balance. He doesn't say burn all your wealth, does he? No. As a matter of fact, the scriptures say give to the poor. It's kind of hard to give to the poor if you have nothing to give. So it's like, well, Lord, how am I supposed to obey that? Take what you have and serve people with it. He's not demonizing money or wealth. He's not saying that wealth is evil. As a matter of fact, Paul says that it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Not money. The love of money is the root of all evil. Notice it's a heart issue. There's nothing wrong with wealth. The scriptures say God is the one that gives us power to create wealth. God is a God that causes prosperity. He wants you to prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. It doesn't mean you will. It does mean that there is a good, righteous, healthy desire and will from God for you to be well. To be in peace. To enjoy. Like, who do you think invented joy? Who made peace? Those are things that God has made for us. This idea of living for tomorrow today, like, if you really are living in the present reality of God with you, you have to realize your hope. You have to live from a place of eternity. Like, if all we're concerned about is what I can get now, me, 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 my, 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 what I want, what I want, what I want, and we're not concerned for the future, we're not concerned with what God has said about the future, it's all about us, let me be comfortable, we miss it. And I know I'm just rambling right now, and I apologize. Nah, I don't. Um... I don't want to be double-minded. I tried. I tried. You know, 
You know, the devil only tempts you with things you already want. James says, James says the temptation comes when our lust, the desire within us, when that is tempted. Like, if you don't like women, the devil ain't going to tempt you with a woman. Just the way it is. If you don't really value money, the devil's not going to tempt you with greed. He only tempts you with the things that you like. He finds what's already in you and tries to bring it out. I can prove it to you. Jesus says to Peter, Satan has desired you to sift you as wheat. You know, when you sift something, that means there's something you want within it. And you're trying to shake everything else out to find that thing that you want. Satan desires to sift you as wheat, Peter. But I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. See, Satan's looking for an enemy in your camp that he can be a comrade with. The scriptures say we have to, we have to wage war. You were born into a war that you didn't start. And the enemy of our souls is trying to find something in you that he can exploit. Remember what Jesus said? He said, the prince of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. What? Jesus said, the prince of this world cometh and he hath nothing in me. He can't find anything in me to tempt. The solution is given by Paul. Paul explains it in such a profound way. In the book of Romans, he talks about being dead to self. We've died to ourselves so we can live for righteousness. You know how you get rid of the evil and the the traitor in your own camp? You got to die. It's your own flesh. It's your own fleshly inner desires. That's what Satan plays on. You want victory? Proclaim yourself dead. Give up. Be broken. Allow yourself to be broken before the Lord and say, Lord, I want to die before you. I want to have your life. Kill this thing in me so that way the devil won't have a foothold. We got to look at the eternal things, folks. Too many times we worry about what we look like in the mirror, what people think about us, how we are on the outside. We forget that there's an enemy in the camp that we need to put to death daily, our flesh. I want to see the people of God victorious, and, and it's hard to be victorious in a fight if we ignore the real issues going on. You know, the gospel begins with a call to repentance, Repentance. Admit that something in you is wrong and repent. That you have sin in you. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That the life of holiness and repentance is the life that God has called us to. You don't hear that a lot anymore. The world doesn't want to hear that. There's a lot of churches that don't want to hear that. Talking about holiness and living righteously. It's like, what do you think the Lord saved you for? If he was just going to save you to save you, he'd have killed you right after you got baptized. Whoop, that person's done. They're saved now. No, the scriptures say he has saved us that we might live righteous and soberly in this present evil age. Righteously. We got work to do. There is... An enemy in the scriptures say that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Ephesians 6 says that we war not against flesh and blood. People are not your enemy. We wrestle against principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. That's only talking about a handful of things. Those are demons, evil spirits, the devil. That's what principalities and powers are. 
But the minute you begin to talk about the devil and Satan, it's like people back up. They don't want to hear that. They don't want to talk about that. It's scary. There is a horde of evil spirits possessing and driving people to madness in this world right now. And for some of us, it hasn't come to our doorsteps, so we ignore it. And we as the people of God need to get back in the scripture and back on our knees praying for God to give us strength. Praying that God's power would set people free. If you don't believe in demons possessing people and you don't believe in devils running people's lives, it's like, well, what was Jesus and the apostles casting out then? You know that the demon possession didn't stop after the cross? You know that Paul cast out demons? I'm, I'm trying to be as hopeful and encouraging as possible, but we got to wake up, church. There are people probably in your own family. You can't understand why, why is it that they are so hostile They want to kill Jesus. Those demons, those evil spirits that are possessing people, they don't want to hear Jesus. They don't want to hear about God. You ever have someone who doesn't believe in God just keep on talking to keep you from saying anything? That is a demon fighting for its home. People don't like it when I start talking like this because it gets a little scary. But we got to have a reality check, church. Like, do you believe this book? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. People are not your enemy. There are spiritual forces at work right now lying to your children, trying to get your kids into sexual pornography, impurity. On Listen. We can't be ignorant of the the enemy's devices. And I I love that word, devices. Like, if you have kids with tablets and phones, you better check those things once in a while and see what they're looking at. And there's some young people that are like, oh, you're telling my parents to invade my privacy. No, I'm telling your parents to save your soul. We got kids looking at and listening to doctrines of demons right now. In your houses, your families, your community. If you, don't, if you don't hear anything else, the proof, the proof is that some of these kids have listened to these evil voices so long that they've taken their own lives. And the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Who do you think has done that? When kids commit suicide in our community, that comes because the evil one's been talking in their ear. Church, we got a world that needs to hear the truth. We got to point out evil and sin, especially when it's in our own homes. Don't you take out the trash at your home? You, you won't settle for a trash, you know, your trash can, it begins to pile up. You say, somebody better take that out. It's starting to stink in here. We'll take out our physical trash. Lord, help me. I love the church of God, and I believe that I've been called to comfort, strengthen, and encourage. And one of the ways that we're dying is we're not taking out the trash in our own homes. I can't even stomach TV anymore. And there are many of you that are like, man, I I quit stomaching TV a long time ago. (laughs) And God bless you. There's so much evil doctrine. And we don't even think it's doctrine because it's not being taught by teachers. It's just being shown to us. Like, our young people are being taught in ways, like, if you don't actively teach your kids to follow the Lord, the world is actively seeking to lead them astray. That's the truth. 
Evil men do evil things. That's a reality. And this idea of living for tomorrow today, like we have to go back and read the last chapter again. Some of us need a refresher. There's going to be a great river, crystal clear, proceeding from the throne of God, going down the middle of the holy city, and on both sides, trees planted, and the leaves are for the healing of the nations, and it bears its fruit every month, 12 months, 12 kinds of fruit. And the people can eat from this bounty and drink from this clear water. And the scripture says there's going to be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more death. And we shall behold God and see his face. There's coming a day where people are going to be judged for whether or not they accepted the Lord or rejected him. And those that don't know him, that don't receive him, Jesus himself said that the angels will go out. And it's a terrifying thought. We don't tremble at this word anymore. But Jesus said that the angels he'll send forth and he'll take all the wicked and all that cause offense. And he'll bind them into bundles and cast them into the furnace. And they'll burn and they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is a horrible tomorrow for people. You have great hope. The new Jerusalem, a new heaven and a new earth. Heaven, we call it, in the presence of God. And people need to know this hope. The time is getting short. Listen, if Jesus doesn't come back for a thousand years, the time is still getting short because you won't be here in a thousand years. Your body's already dying. We're on borrowed time. And there's coming a time where your eyes will close in the sleep of death and they will awaken to an eternity. What are you doing? When I preach like this and I speak like this, too many times I think we have to rush about and do too many things. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to encourage you to try to rush about and fix everything. I'm calling you to prayer. I'm calling you to scripture. We got to read this book. Do we really believe what Jesus said? And are we praying and asking him to guide us? I get tired of the lies. I get tired of people holding up Jesus and justifying themselves because they just hold up a picture of Jesus. Like, do you actually follow him? That's what I want to know. Do you actually believe him? If it hasn't been apparent now that I really could care less what people think and I really care about what God thinks about me, let me say this. And I mean this in the kindest, most loving way I can say it. If all lives matter, that means black lives matter. Do you realize that? Do you realize that their lives are included in that? So don't throw out the one just to hold up the other. I listened to a guy that was saying, it just matters. Not matters more than other lives. They just matter. Like, if you're offended at that, I don't know what to say. I really don't. You don't want people to judge the police based on a few people doing horrible things. Well, don't blame the protests on a few people burning things. Like, can we, like, use your logic in all arenas. If it's true here, it has to be true here, right? Like, we all realize there are some bad, corrupt cops that kill people. It doesn't mean they're all bad, does it? 
Doesn't it mean that what they stand for and who they're trying to defend and protect and serve means something to them? That the police officers who are good and want to do what's righteous, that they are actually trying to protect something that they love? Well, let me tell you, the people burning properties, destroying things in the protests, they don't represent the majority who just want justice for their lives to matter. But what, this is what prejudice does. We take the whole group and we say, this group is right, this group is wrong. That's foolish. You know that there are foolish people in both groups? There are foolish people in all the groups, including church. I want to be justified before God when I stand before him to know, to know that I didn't hold anything back, that I spoke the truth. And I don't care what it costs me. I don't. We all do it. I, I do it. I judge an entire group based off of a few people. This has got to stop. Especially in the church of God, it's got to stop. If anywhere, please let the church of God repent. Like if the whole world wants to go crazy... You know, if a system has set up that incentivizes the evil behavior of a select few, those few aren't oppressors. They're victims of that system, too. And the whole system needs to be put on trial. The only thing that's going to start healing is if everyone would repent and admit where they've gotten it wrong. Instead of pointing the finger and saying, that person's a sinner, that person's a sinner, that person's wrong. It's like, no, I'm wrong. I've been prejudiced. I've been a racist. I've been lustful. I've been greedy. I've done evil to my fellow man. And I'm to blame You know what? If Jesus died for everyone, that means everyone's guilty. That doesn't justify, like, (laughs) that's the thing that that boggles me, boggles my mind. It's like people are just, well, Jesus died for everyone, so everyone matters. No, everyone's guilty. That's why he had to die for everyone. That's the point. We're evil. We're sinful. We need a savior to save us from our sins. And the moment we begin to stop blaming others and receive it to ourselves, I'm a sinner. I'm wicked. I'm evil. I need Jesus. That is when the healing begins. This finger pointing is getting old. I tell you what. There's coming a day when all these crooked fingers that point will turn back to ash and dust. And your judgments will never stand. The judgment of Almighty God will stand. He is the righteous one. There is no other. He is the only one that can endure the wrath of God. Everything else will be turned to ash when his wrath is poured out. God help us. God help us. And I say to you, to any of you 
who still seek to justify yourselves. Good luck with that. If you justify yourself, you've fallen from grace. Christ is the only one that can justify you. Christ is the only one that can justify you. And it was by his precious blood, not by some smart quip on Facebook or Twitter. You're not going to be justified. The scriptures say that you are snared by the words of your mouth. That's why it's a scary, fearful thing for me to speak this way. You're all, do you know that you're always snared by the words of your mouth? If you speak lies, God will snare you and destroy you. If you speak the truth, men will snare you and seek to destroy you. It's the way it is. See, don't, don't think it a strange thing when the world hates you. Didn't Jesus say that if the world hates you? Jesus has called us to something greater, folks. And I've been wrong way more than I've been right. I've been so wrong most of my life. And the few times that I get it right, wasn't me anyway, it was some gift of God. Like when I get it right, that's, I used to say to my wife, it's like all that stuff that you love about me, Jesus put that there. All that stuff you hate about me, that's just me. It's the truth. Like all the goodness in your life, everything about you that is righteous, true, good, brave, courageous, Christ put that in you. Christ put that in you. He wants you to be good. He wants you to be righteous. He wants you to have peace. He wants you to have joy. He puts those things there. All the other trash, we got to repent of that, church. We got to take the trash out. We got to throw that stuff away. And that's, that's what he was saying. Isn't that what he's saying? In Colossians, put that stuff away. Put to death sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire. Put them all away. Put out the trash of anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk. Take out the trash. Set your mind on Christ who is above. Where your heart is, there your treasure is. Set your mind on things above. Take out the trash in your life. Repent. Turn from sin. I'm tired. I'm worn. Pray with me. Father, you're great and you're good. You've shown us what is right and what is true. You've shown us what we must do. You, Lord Jesus, you lived a life of truth, of justice, of healing and restoration. You call us to follow you. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in us as it is in your Son. Let your will be done in us as it is in your son. Give us what we need today. A hope for tomorrow of eternity with you. Give us the strength we need to fight, to stand up for righteousness. Forgive us for our wickedness. 
as we forgive those who are wicked. Teach us to live a good life, to live for your glory. All things belong to you. All things were made for you. You will destroy perfectly and you will create anew. When your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants will learn of your righteousness. When thy judgments, Lord, are poured out from heaven, the earth shall tremble. Hide us. Hide us in Christ from your wrath. We praise you. We praise you for your judgments and we praise you for your mercy. Please, Lord, show us mercy. Show us mercy. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, I'm not, I'm not going to give a normal invitation. I just want you to think about who is really in control of the future. Think about the words to this song. God's the one that's in control. We are not in control. We need to surrender to his will and trust in his justice. Trust in his truth. Proclaim it to the world. Stand up for what's right. Stand up for what's right.